Hang on a minute. What just <laughs> happened? What just happened here? What about happens just going out for a nice little glass of wine? They think we're too much or something. <laughs> I yeah, I've heard that a few times. Yeah. So... You know what? You're not enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the ADHD Untangled podcast. My name is Rosie and I have ADHD. And like many other ADHDers, the majority of my life has felt chaotic to say the very least, due to what I describe as having a tangled brain. Let's get untangled and show the world what we are made of. Trigger warning. The Untangled podcast does cover some sensitive topics that could be triggering to some. So please be sure to read the full description before listening in. Please note that the majority of the guests on the Untangled podcast do have ADHD, including myself, which means we will interrupt each other, forget what we're saying and go off topic. Hello and welcome to episode number 10. Number 10 we're at, 10 weeks in, I can't believe it. And today's guest is pretty special. Her name is Sharifa J. Now you've probably heard of her. She is a model, presenter, mental health campaigner. And this girl is just on fire, let me tell you. She is everything this podcast represents. She turns struggles into strengths, pain into power. She is so inspirational. She loves exercise. She presents um, everything there is to do with like confidence and going out there and stepping into your power. I absolutely love this girl. She's really inspiring me to, you know, go out there and show the world what I'm made of. So I hope you get a lot from this chat. We're going to talk all things dating, exercise, ADHD diagnosis, you name it, we're covering it. So let's get untangled and show the world what we are made of. Oh, I feel like I'm on a dating show. Yeah. Speed Hi. Dating. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sharifa. I'm from, where am I from? Do you know, it's a really strange question to ask me because I don't know where I'm from these days. I've been everywhere. I live in London. <laughs> I'm from Norwich. I was born in Torquay. I spent some time living in Australia. Um, But I would definitely say I'm a Londoner. I think that's where my my spirit lies, is in London. Um, So, yeah, um, Sharifa, live in London. Uh, I work as a plus-size model, presenter, mental health campaign. I wouldn't really say I work as that, but I do that, and I love that, alongside many other things. I don't know how to really put them all into one sentence, but... um, just a person who's kind of out here on the internet um, sharing my journey, sharing things I care about. Um, I do a lot of charity work and um, just, yeah, try and, I love sport, try and get people involved in sport as much as possible because I love sport myself. So yeah, that's me, I think. Wonderful. A lot's going on there. (laughs) You're on fire. (laughs) So let's move on to the ADHD stuff. So, well, you was diagnosed at quite young, wasn't you? So it's quite a while ago. So do you want to talk around how that start? you know, the struggle, first of all? So what was happening in your life for you to eventually, you know, get to that point where you went for a diagnosis? And how was that experience? Obviously, I'd grown up with ADHD because you do grow up with ADHD. Mm-hmm. You either have it or you don't have it. And as a kid, I was so all over the place. I mean, I and looking back now, I can see all of my very obvious ADHD traits that no one picked up yeah. um, because we have such a lack of education around ADHD in women and, and girls um, and, and autism as well, ADHD and autism in women and girls. Um, there's a massive gender health gap when it comes to that. And ADHD was a little boy's thing, little boy's problem, wasn't it? It was never really seen in little girls. And so um, definitely didn't get picked up in me. So I was the naughty kid. I was like always in the naughty corner. I remember sitting in class and like, you know, being at my desk and just being hysterically laughing and not being able to stop and getting sent out of the class because I was just so hyperactive, finding everything really funny. I was never a bad kid, but I was just so like in my own world, unruly, could never stand in the line, could never sit still. And I'd always have this issue before school if I could never find like the socks that had the right feeling. 
mm. in them that I wouldn't go to school. I'd have a tantrum. I'd like throw my socks off. I am not going. <laughs> and, um, because I have a real issue with sensory things, which again, I've learned over the years with ADHD is, is a thing. And I've yeah. now I'm very aware of my sens- sensory issues. But as a kid, this just was all these things were affecting me and I was always getting in trouble. Um, and people would always say, Sharif is so bright, but she's just so silly. <laughs> uh, and I'm still really silly. So it's not really changed much. Um, and yeah, as I kind of na- try to navigate through adult life, these the, the issues that I faced as a kid, they didn't really go away. Like I was still unruly. I was still hyperactive. I was still... I I used to do a lot of temping jobs. I used to spray that. I think I told you on our Instagram live. Mm. I used to spray like the perfume and selfridges at people, you know, Shh, Dior. Dior. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the job was to stand there for six hours a day in a little suit, like a skirt suit and heels mm. in selfridges. And um, where else did I do it? Harvey Nichols. And not talk to anyone and just spray the perfume, Dior. But me not talking to anyone, oh, that's like hell on earth for me. Yeah, <laughs> so oh my God. I just couldn't do the job. It was such a simple job, but I couldn't do it. And I kept getting in trouble. And then, you know, the agency that I was working for were like, you know, they, they like you, you sell the perfume, but you've got to stop chatting to people about their lives. I was like, why? Yeah. <laughs> why Surely people that? like that though. Well, you'd think so, wouldn't you? But it was very like, you know, a bit, bit stuffy mm. in those environments. And um, I found myself actually getting fired a lot. I was losing a lot of jobs. I was I was unable to manage my schedule and my life. And it started to make me feel really depressed because I just was spiraling. I didn't really know how to how to manage. And, and um, on top of that, I had many years of disordered eating, which again is really symptomatic of ADHD. ADHD or ADD mm-hmm. and that started from sort of the age of 14 and, and went all the way up until sort of age 24 um and I uh, you know happy to say that I've really overcome that now and um haven't haven't dealt with it for many years but that was a huge issue for me as well so yeah all of these things combined I just realized I had an issue my sister was actually the one that pointed out to me that she thought I might have ADHD because she also has it and she's a doctor so I was really lucky because I was in a position where I was around someone who was really knowledgeable and close to me and close enough to me to say I think you need to get some help with this and that's when I went to the doctor got my diagnosis and you know, literally went to I think I was diagnosed in the Donald Winnicott Centre um in London and I I pretty much walked into the clinic and uh (laughs) went into the meeting room and he was like uh before I'd even said anything he was like it is very clear to me you have ADHD (laughs) it's really funny I was like particularly hyperactive that day (laughs) and um in the in the um like the lobby area I met another guy with ADHD and we were having this really like hyperactive conversation and um and yeah and the the two our two uh like doctors who were with us were like just observing (laughs) the back and forth of this weird conversation (laughs) um yeah I, I I would say like I'm definitely not as hyperactive as I used to be back then I've definitely found ways to calm but I used to be like off the walls hyperactive yeah. like would you just be like is this girl is she all right mm-hmm. you know so I've managed to curb it a little bit but yeah I went through the diagnosis process and um got my medication pretty much I, I'm on the same medication that I started started on I'm on okay. um, Concerta XL 18 milligrams yes. I think was the first dose of uh, medication I got put on and I've been on that same medication for years mm-hmm. and actually I've been trying to, um, well, they've increased the dose over the years, but like I've actually been trying to change my medication. And I had a text from the doctor recently saying, um, we cannot change your medication. You need to come in for um, a diagnosis. No. I was like, what? (laughs) What? What? No. Yeah, I'm very confused about that. So I'll, I'll um, apparently the waiting list is like five years or something. Yeah, no, it's ridiculous. It's funny you say that because I had uh, a guy on here who got diagnosed when he was younger and he said that that his diagnosis only lasts every two years. And I was like, surely not. What? 
I know, but I, well, this one, I mean, are. there's no consistency, honestly. Everyone's story is so different when it comes you to You either have it or you don't have it. Like, it doesn't go away. I know, <laughs> honestly, it's crazy. They also said to me that time will, okay, will give you some sessions of cognitive behavioral therapy that, that never happened. Mm. Um, and so I was, I don't really know why I never got them, but I just never got them. And then I, I moved to Australia shortly after that. Wow. <laughs> and then that was pretty much it. Like, I've never had any support beyond that no it no. was like here's your medication one meeting and everything else I've just had to learn myself and figure out how to manage and I've put myself through therapy put myself through hypnotherapy but I mean that's an absolute privilege like I was only able to do that because I had a good year of work yeah <laughs> last year <laughs> but otherwise <laughs> it's just it was so expensive I, I wouldn't have been able to do it so um and for a long time I couldn't afford the therapy um mm. it was only when I had a little bit of extra money to be able to do it that I I did so yeah. so yeah that's a really long-winded way to answer your question just a few things on that so you know like a, a lot of people will say what's the point in getting diagnosed really what what do you think that you know the diagnosis done for you like how much would you really say that changed your life like was it that impactful would you say so many reasons why you should get diagnosed in my opinion, but obviously it's very personal to everyone. Mm. Clarity, support, uh, medication, if you want it. Um, uh, a little bit of, I, I guess, validation in a way, yeah. like understanding that, okay, I am this way because of this reason. And one thing that I really struggled with, with ADHD was shame. I had so much shame surrounding it. I felt so annoyed and angry at myself. Why am I like this? Why can't I just get to places on time? Why can't I just not be hyperactive? I spent so many of my life, so many years of my life masking my personality because I was so fed up with this person that I was yeah. um, because of these ADHD traits. And then as soon as I got that diagnosis and I was able to research and figure out, okay, I do that because of that. And I do that because of that. Um, it just helped me to break down that shame and mm. and put a reason to it, you know, rather than just like, I'm broken. <laughs> Instead, I was like, no, I'm not. I'm just a person with a neurodivergent condition. And here are some of my traits. And they're not necessarily bad traits. In fact, sometimes I would say my traits are quite positive and quite good mm. um, in lots of lots of ways. Like I was saying to you before we got on the call that I've basically not slept for the last four weeks because I've been so busy with work um but I'm still able to like show up and have energy and I think that's an ADHD thing it definitely is <laughs> because I've <laughs> always got energy <laughs> people look and go how are you functioning <laughs> no we're like, just, no. Got like so I'm, much energy. I'm perpetually exhausted but I look like I'm so energized people yeah. are so fresh <laughs> vibrant I'm like I'm <laughs> so tired I woke up this morning and cried <laughs> yeah. um so yeah I would say yeah all of those things clarity um it, the 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 opportunity to be able to kind of put a name to, to what it is some people don't like labels some people don't like medication mm. some people don't like the idea of that but but for me existing in this way where my ADHD felt so out of control it gave me control it yeah. gave me like, and and also some credibility. Like, I think one thing when you meet, talk to people about ADHD, one of the first things they'll say is like, oh, so do you have a diagnosis? I always hear that. Do you have a diagnosis? I sometimes feel like people who have self-diagnosed with ADHD, I think that, I think there's a bit of an idea that, that these people are less, I don't know, credible, not credible, but like, I think people take you less seriously. Yeah, especially already where, you know, ADHD isn't taken seriously as it should be. Exactly. So it's like you almost need that extra. You need that uh, bit of credibility. You yeah. Know? Yes. A medical professional has told me I have this. So yeah. you have to take me seriously now because this is a real serious thing. And there are still people who, even though I have a diagnosis with ADHD, will still tell me that it doesn't exist and that it's all in my head and that I can just overcome it. <laughs> Like, cool story, bro. Tell another one. Yeah, <laughs> I've been exactly. trying that for the last uh, <laughs> few years, but I'll keep trying. <laughs> that is so true. And I, and I think what you were describing there as well, it's like that compassion for yourself, which is so important after years of, like you say, beating yourself up for 
not being able to struggling with the simple things really yeah, definitely in words um thank you for sharing that that was really amazing and I wanted to move on to dating with ADHD so I've been wanting to talk about this topic for so long and I feel like you are the perfect candidate um and after seeing your because after seeing your love for solo um dates as well because I love going out taking myself out on a date it's like my favorite thing (laughs) It's the best. Yeah. Honestly. How has your experience been with relationships and dating with ADHD? Has it showed up? Do you think ADHD showed up a lot? <laughs> <laughs> that was a big Ooh. nod there, by the way. <laughs> so I, I think the main thing that comes to my mind is rejection sensitivity dysphoria. Yes. Mm, yeah. I, I, used to, I used to have that <laughs> really badly. I've worked very hard to like, overcome the rejection sensitivity it used to be very bad but but luckily as I'm a, I'm a model and a, a presenter and I am so used to being rejected in my day-to-day life I mean I probably get five or six rejections a week through work mm-hmm. um so I've I've actually been able to reframe rejection quite a lot in my mind but especially in the early days of of getting like you know in my early 20s of like dating and being involved with people oh my god like if they didn't text me back I'd be like oh. yeah <laughs> Awful. why you love for me <laughs> yeah I don't understand I don't it's so consuming, consuming though isn't it it is like you cannot get on with anything else <laughs> awful and I think where you also have that hyper focus and super focus yeah you can have a tendency to hyper focus on people so like if I have a crush I have a crush and <laughs> anyone who is listening to this if you know that you've been my crush please understand that you've lived rent free in my head for at least one week <laughs> And I've thought of nothing else. <laughs> I totally relate to that. But then what happens is this weird thing. I don't know if you get this as well, where they're my crush. I'm obsessed with them. I've married them in my head, right? Like we yes. are living together. We have three children. We have a house. I'm in love with them. And then they'll text me the next week like, hey, babes, what's up? And I'll be like, oh, not bothered. No. <laughs> Go off them. Yeah, exactly. It's the wanting. That's where the dopamine yeah. comes from. It's not actually getting it. It's the wanting. Not actually thing. them. It's like the yeah. Thing. I mean, I think a lot of women actually do this, but I think where ADHD brains do hyper focus a lot. I think we tend to hyper focus on like romantic connections, yeah. definitely a lot more. And I'm very like, I mean, I'm a very loyal person. Like once I'm in with someone, I'm all in. Mm. But I've actually not met that person that I'm like all in with ever I'm, I'm very much single I've been single for probably nine years yeah. and uh, I meet people and don't get me wrong you know I'm out here yeah sometimes meeting people but <laughs> nothing ever really takes my fancy enough to want to like you know I, do you know what I think it is as well like when you spend time getting really you know comfortable and happy being on your own like we were saying you know going out on these dates taking ourselves out on dates and you know we just feel in a content place I always say like, it's going to take something pretty special or it's got to be something that, you know, I'm going to want to give up the life you've created for yourself and it's got to be worth it, you know? Yeah. And I also think, I don't know if this is a British man thing, but I've noticed that British men are significantly different to like other types of men. Like American men are very forward. They're very, they're very like, you're beautiful. I want to take you out on a date, you know, and <laughs> that's a really bad accent. They'll say that like, you know, probably like fairly early on, they see dating culturally. I think dating is very different in, in places like America than it is in the UK. If you even text a man back, they think you're trying to marry them. Now I did say previously <laughs> that I um, marry them in my head, yeah. <laughs> but that's only a couple. That's only a couple. They're not all them sometimes I just think oh hey you know let's go out for a drink let's go out yeah go out like it's not that deep but I think men in the UK they're very like tentative about the dating thing Mm. I kind of noticed that I don't know if you've noticed that yeah I have they're very like they literally think that you're trying to marry them if you're just like hey let's catch up yeah let's go for a drink back too quickly yeah well into me it's almost like in some ways I find as well I'm like well, what makes you think that I'm wanting to, I'm wanting a full-on relationship right now anyway? Like, why do they always assume that you want that? Well, oh, my God. 
I had, and I hope, hopefully this guy, this guy doesn't see this podcast. I'm sure he won't, but um, <laughs> I had this exact thing. I met this guy a while back. We, we met like organically. We, we had like a good vibe. Um, so I text him afterwards. We, we, you know, swapped numbers and he, he mentioned when I saw him, oh, we should do this together. And I was like, cool. Sounds good. So I text him saying, oh, hey, like, so um, let's catch up. Let's go for a drink or whatever. And he was like, yeah, cool. Sounds great. How about next week? And then, OK, next week comes. And then I'm like, hey, so the drink. And he's like, oh, yeah, um, hmm, book a bit busy. Maybe next week. And then we chat a bit more and then it like, gets put off. You know how it goes. Gets mm. put off. And then he invites me to a couple of other things. But they're like with all his friends. And I'm like, I don't want to see your friends. I just kind of want to see you. And then he just sent me this message like, listen, Sharif, uh, um, you know, um, I am just really, I don't want to, I don't want to hurt you. Um, I'm just really not looking for anything like serious right now. And I think we're probably on different vibes um, at the moment. So like, I was like, hold on a second. <laughs> who, what the hell? <laughs> who, who said I was looking for anything serious? Yeah. And who said, who said you're going to hurt me? I what? know. What is happening here? He was like, you know, I really respect you and I don't want to disrespect you by like taking you out on a date and then not following through. I'm like, who says I'm going to want to follow through? Yeah. Really <laughs> similar so, experiences to that. I and mean, it's almost uh, like after you, you recheck, you're like, hang on a minute. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> what just happened here? What happens just going out for a nice little glass of wine? Yeah. Just, and just, you know. It's like, so, yeah. like these two are these fragile people. <laughs> exactly. And I also wonder if with ADHD, I wonder if we're a bit, a bit quite passionate and um, I think maybe we have a tendency to have big personalities. Like everyone with ADHD that I know has a big personality yeah. and is quite like, um, and is and is quite not full on, but I think some men might find the kind of openness and direct and, and the, you know, very expressive people that we are. Maybe they find that a bit like, yeah. <laughs> I, I think some people say they they think we're too much or something <laughs> yeah i've heard that a few times yeah so... you know what? you're not enough <laughs> yeah <laughs> meet me where i am okay have you ever chosen like you know the wrong people and now do you have like you know if you see the red flags or you think oh god that's just my adhd chasing dopamine do you sort are you able to like pull back do you know what i spent a long time just avoiding dating altogether yeah um, and then I had some hypnotherapy, actually, which wasn't just for dating, but it was for so like how my relationship with myself and social media and my work and um, and also dating. And I've sort of been able to reframe dating in my mind as like this thing that I used to focus on as being like, oh, if they don't text me back, it means that I'm not pretty anymore. Or, you know, <laughs> but uh, um, I've got a bit more of a like no fucks given attitude to it now. Yeah. If I like someone, I just say, hey, I like you. Do you want to go and do this? And if they're like, no, bugger off, I'm like, cool. Never mind. Have a nice life. And if they're like, yeah, sounds good, then I'm like, cool. And I've just got a little bit. Yeah. So when it comes to dating, do I see red flags? I mean, I've not really got that far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I haven't really got that far to like see the flags, but. I don't know. I've been able to overcome my rejection sensitivity. That's really big. Yeah. yeah. And just like, and just, I just see that, you know, people are people and, you know, you're not going to really get to know someone properly unless you just kind of put yourself out there. So I just, I'm just, yeah. I don't you know. Could... <clears throat> answer the question, did I? <laughs> no, you did. And do you, Maybe I don't know do, the answer. Do you think hip, hypnotherapy then was really, really a game changer for you then? hypnotherapy was the best thing I've done that's the that's the best money I've ever spent really I would spend it again no I wouldn't because it's very expensive but I I would recommend to anyone who who can afford it to give it a go I think you have to have the right hypnotherapist my hypnotherapist is called Meg Charland Hmm. I think it was like at Meg Charland and she just changed my brain my way of seeing things she helped me to to break down so so much shame and so many like ideas I had about myself and um like really sounds so cheesy but like really walk in my truth yeah I love that I feel like more than ever before I really know who I am I know what I want I know what my values are and a lot of that came through hypnotherapy and 
breaking down ideas and like weird parts in my brain that had just sort of like put themselves there <clears throat> like I had this part in my brain that was like even though you're a model you're ugly 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 oh <laughs> I don't know God. why but I don't know why it goes <laughs> but it just like... you've gone through every accent it's got... <laughs> And I really like, even though I would see, okay, objectively, I work as a model. And so maybe there's something that the industry likes mm. from me. But, but, you know, I'm obviously not attractive because guys don't want to date me. I really had that, like, view about myself and just things like that. But now I'm walking into the club like, I am here. Yeah. I am a model, don't you know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not quite like that, but yeah, it's so, it's so valuable. I don't even know how to put it into words, how valuable it is, but I would just say it was better than any talking therapy that, that I've ever done better than any cognitive behavioral therapy. It worked faster as well. Mm. Got rid of my fear of the dark. I was really afraid of the wow. dark. I'm really anxious. I used to have really bad anxiety. So imagine this is such, this is so, um, what's the word? It's very ironic. I've always been really passionate about presenting. I love presenting. I love hosting interviews and writing talks and being on camera, being on stage. I've always loved it, but I also used to have stage fright. <laughs> <laughs> you hear that a lot though, don't you? Not helpful. Yeah, really bad stage fright. Because when I was about 11 or something, I went on stage and I forgot my lines and then I froze on stage and I didn't know what to do. And then I had like an anxiety attack or something. I don't really, can't quite remember what happened, but it scarred me for life. And then I went to drama school and I did the same at drama school. I'd always get on stage and be like, <laughs> And then panic in my head. And, you know, I'd actually managed, you know, I wasn't always panicking out, outwardly, but inwardly I was always panicking. And um, one of the first things that Meg did with me was help to break down my stage fright. And I I literally, I go on stage now, I could stand in front of like 200 people and I just think I'm just, I don't even notice. <laughs> so I'm just amazing talking. though, isn't it? Yeah, it's amazing. It's really powerful. Because this is the, this is what I keep talking about on the podcast is about reframing, you know, your thought. Because that's basically what hypnotherapy is, right? It's the same thing. It's just reframing, you know, what's going on and turning those, you know, negative beliefs, self doubt, turning it all around. And I think, like, well, we, I know we were talking about dating, but in every aspect of your life, you have to get that sorted first. The stories you're telling yourself, reframing them, changing the story you're telling yourself, now showing up as you, your confident version of who you really are. And then that filters into so many other things in your life, like the decisions you're making, the people you're choosing to be around, because you know your worth. It's so true. And I think also as ADHDers and also women with ADHD, I think that we fit in a kind of unique group of people. Mm. You can always, like I say, you can always tell an ADHD. I think you can anyway. Yeah. I've, always, okay. I've always spot an ADHD across, from across the room. I'm Same. like, okay your traits I see how you're moving I see your energy like you you're definitely the hands. see the hands <laughs> and everything and I think that women in our society we are taught to shrink ourselves right we are taught to like be demure and little and quiet and like don't speak up and don't have too much energy and don't overshadow the men in the room and don't be loud and don't be confident and I think that when you experience that as a woman with ADHD in, in our society then you can end up masking and covering up who you are yeah. not being able to be your full self because work doesn't permit it or you know you work in an office where you have to be like calm and quiet and not saying that all offices are like that but I think that that what can happen is you then end up being becoming a very inauthentic version of yourself to exist in society and that's painful because you're 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 pre you're suppressing who, who you are and then it comes out in other ways you know am I making yeah. sense no 100 percent. so yeah. relatable and I think that's it it's tiring you know like they yes. say it's tiring it's pretending and masking and, and being something you're not that is so much effort <laughs> to wake up every day and show up as someone else and there was a it's statement that was made actually on this podcast that um on my first episode and they said who was you before your ADHD diagnosis it was Dawn from ADHD AF and she said everyone else and it's true like I think that's what we experience a lot with ADHD when we're especially undiagnosed like we are showing up it's, as being we don't know who we are I feel so grateful that I'm able to make money in this industry that I work in because the industry that I'm in allows me to have, yeah. have my personality as it is. 
I mean, don't get me wrong, there's still drawbacks to it. Like I will still very much have to stand on the X and I'll have to listen to instructions when I need to. And so mm-hmm. that's always my learning process of like trying to make sure that I'm still being professional and bringing my personality <laughs> up. Yeah. Um, but, it, you know, in the world of modeling, like modeling is a very um, be seen and don't be heard sort of industry. Yeah. Um, and I've been on a lot of jobs where I've really struggled for the day because I'm not really supposed to be saying anything and no one's talking to me and I'm just putting the clothes on and doing this. And I might as well be in an office or I might as well be in a corporate job um, mm. because that is also as much of a struggle. But I'm I'm lucky. I'm happy to say that in the last few years, I've been doing more sort of campaign based jobs where I wouldn't really be required to like do as much of that type of modeling like I'll oh, do yeah. more like they want my personality and they yeah. might get you out and then they want me to smile and laugh and okay I can like be myself be myself how nice <laughs> yeah and that's the thing I suppose Sorry. you're like now able to sort of look at that and choose those types of jobs over the ones that make you feel uncomfortable a bit more as well yeah I mean I can't choose every job but, yeah no <laughs> but, but but yeah I have been able to like kind of find work that aligns with who I am as a person but when I was doing different jobs and when I, you know, I've done all sorts of, I've done bloody every job under the sun. I've been a nail technician. I've been a cleaner. I've worked in restaurants. I've uh, worked in offices. I've temped. I mean, my friends make a running joke about how many jobs I've had. (laughs) I've had like, you see my HMRC, um, like, you know, you can get like a report from the HMRC about all the people you've paid tax through mine is just like 42 different columns of like every person that's employed me in like a very small window um and these were just all like temp jobs and different jobs that I was in and out of I just didn't get fired from them all just um, <laughs> <laughs> but I some some I just really struggled like there was actually days where I had to walk out because I I couldn't yeah do the job and so I I really feel for people who are in a role like that with ADHD and and finding it hard to like cope with their day-to-day yeah 100% and I think that's you know because a lot of companies are not set up for people like us I've I've tried many times to be in corporate environments as an EA and I was like (laughs) I used to last what a year maximum because I'd be like I cannot be chained to my desk like this this is this is killing me and, you know, that's what I hope as well, because some people don't want to, um, you know, or maybe don't have the privilege to go out now and try different jobs because they're tied down, you know, with commitments and stuff and money. But maybe they, you know, now workplaces can start once, you know, now that ADHD is being spoke about, start catering a bit more. You know, we yeah. work in sprints. We don't we don't want to be sitting down all day like we need a bit of flexibility, but we'll get twice as much done in a couple of hours if you let us have that freedom, you know. I love that idea. I love the idea of there being some actual education in the world. Yeah. I, I remember trying to have a discussion with my previous model booker at my agency to say like, hey, look, I have ADHD. And when you send emails in this way or when you do this, I find it very hard to keep up. And yeah. it's making well, like life really hard for me. And she was just like, you know, but that's just like how we do it. Oh, yeah. It's just how we do it. Whereas, you know, my new booker, who's just a amazing she has been so responsive to like when I say like hey I've got you know I have a like a shared diary with my management team and my Mm -hmm. model agent and like she's so good at like looking in the diary and like putting things in there and like you know really communicating and and understanding that I would struggle with like scheduling so she makes an effort for that sort of stuff and I just think and my my current manager like will literally like they'll send me a whatsapp and they'll put everything in this we have this app called time tree and they'll put everything in this time tree and then they'll label it all and then okay shrifa we're reminding you about this and just that lit is so good and it's like a little thing it they might not even realize just how much impact it makes but that makes a world of difference for me having people support me and going you know just a reminder that this is coming up here and this is happening here and here how can we help you here um but helping you thrive lot, and that's the thing it will help people thrive more yeah and and yeah. and then because of that I'm not late to, I mean I think I was one minute late for our podcast. No. <laughs> but, you know I think because of that I do show up and I do do my best job and I keep yeah. doing work and it works for everyone just that little bit of understanding makes such a big difference and um, I think that 
employers are really missing a trick because they're not yeah. getting the best out of their employees because they're probably sitting at their desk masking wanting to get up and fidget you know that I hate sitting at a chair at a desk I don't know about you but I end I up do. On half the day I'm like you know but I'm lucky because I can work from home but even things like that like why are we all doing this same thing you know yeah. work for everyone um so I think employers really need to get with the program me too it's something I really want to like be part of. I really want to be part of helping Same. change that because I spent so much time doing that and they just don't like you want to do a good job and you can thrive we've got such good you know big talents which we'll move on to now and strengths it's like you want to get the most out of these you know these people they're good people you know we're good people to have around once yeah. because you know we can we can do amazing things but we just need that you know like you said that little bit of support and little tweaks and stuff just to help us get there Mm -hmm. and if everything was uh built for a neurodivergent if the world was built for neuro neurodivergent people we wouldn't need support everyone else would need support yes <laughs> it's just that the world is not really catering for us it's not but it's gonna change we're gonna we're, this is what we're doing keep showing up talking about yeah. it um let's move on to that actually strengths because that's what this podcast is all about obviously I think it can be our biggest curse and our biggest gift at the same time ADHD um can you think of you know a, something that's maybe perceived of a struggle with ADHD that you've managed to turn in or embrace as a strength or just a strength that's come from having ADHD oh that's a good one um I think I might have met like mentioned them already in, in this talk but Super focus, yeah, is real. <laughs> and <laughs> when you get into super focus, like the amount of stuff I can get done, I can do like two days' work in like half a day, yeah, and <laughs> still have energy left over. Um, super focus is a, is a superpower. Mm. I I love it. It helps me to edit videos quickly. <laughs> yeah. Um, and creativity I think that ADHD is are really creative people and I think we think differently I um, notice it when I'm writing talks like when I'm writing host like a uh, panel talks or I'm hosting or I'm interviewing somebody one-on-one um, -on -one, the questions that I'll come up with or the just the, the way in which I might interview someone people will say oh I never even thought about it like that like you've just literally like thought in a whole different way and made me think differently um and I've noticed that ADHDers do tend to kind of we're a bit divergent in our way of thinking we don't yeah. not every linear right like it's not the obvious question it's always the other question so definitely like uniqueness and creativity um I always have energy <laughs> so hyperactive <laughs> um you know I do I am frustrated at times for lots of reasons yeah um, but I definitely feel like my ADHD is more of a blessing than a curse these days that's so do you know what that is so inspiring to hear especially for people that might be listening that are going through you know like the first part of the diagnosis and because you do you go through a roller coaster of emotions I think um so what a great thing to hear that now you know with the tools, medication, all these stuff that you've done, now you're seeing it more as a blessing than a curse. Definitely. I think as long as you learn what your traits are and mm. how to manage them. Like I, th I showed you this on our Instagram live last week, but my my avocado. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. It makes me so happy. <laughs> um, this avocado this timer is so simple, but it makes such a difference. Helping me with my time blindness. Like I just mm. put that timer on for 15 minutes. I know 15 minutes is gone. I put it on again. I also got it in a funky color and a funky design because dopamine. Yeah. You know, it's just I, it, it's, you know, I, I find things that I like looking at and then I want to touch them and I want to be around them. Um, yeah. Like the men. No, I'm doing that. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I need a dopamine boyfriend um, yes good so, dopamine um, boyfriend you know learning about color like color is such a big one for the ADHD brain. yeah like, how it yeah can I have just, color coded calendars um, and I have my timers for time blindness and I have um you know I make sure that I get enough sleep and I don't drink too much and I don't have too much caffeine and I manage all those I, I, I write lists in a very specific way um I don't write I don't I uh, believe in lists for anyone with ADHD mm, like no. a list just like you know one two three and love stuff. it 
Yeah, that free. Is... That's what I've been doing, free. And if you get anything else done today on top of that, that's... Yeah, that's I have a few different ways of writing lists, actually. So, like, here's what... I have all these colourful post-it notes. Mm. So sometimes, sometimes if I have, like, like, a few mm, tasks to do in a day mm-hmm. and I'm really struggling, do you ever just get that thing where you're literally just, like, staring into space knowing you've got all All the stuff. time. Yeah. And <laughs> Overwhelm, not... procrastination. Overwhelm. Yeah. And, you're not shut, and then you just done. shut down, basically. Exactly. So sometimes I literally write lists like this. I, I like write, this. I like write one thing. It'll be like do laundry. <laughs> and then it will be like um email um I don't know work. <laughs> <laughs> it will be like um cry. Okay. <laughs> Oh my so, god, this is amazing! I I do it like this, right? I put it onto. I and you could you could even do like if because like me, I love all different colors. You could oh, have so the many. different colors for different things. Like I do have different. Yeah, I have all yeah. the, the different colors for different things and like different priorities. I also like look at my <gasps> <gasps> a little bit. <laughs> but once you've done the thing, you just yeah. do this: do laundry, done. Oh, what a feeling! Rip it what off. A feeling. <laughs> Email work. Done. Done. Cry. Done. Right? So it's it. horrible for the planet. So I am sorry, planet. So make sure you put it in your recycling bin. But yes. it's also like like finding things like that, little like methods that you can use on days mm. when you're feeling particularly overwhelmed. And this if is another thing that I've learned from my sister, who's a doctor with ADHD. Wow. So a man, and she works in um the neonatal unit. Hmm. and she's obviously got to many things to do on a shift and she's she does that with ADHD and she has to yeah so she's like superwoman my sister not jealous at all by the way (laughs) um so So it's like this right so when you write a list you know how normally people write lists like thing 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 yeah they try to cross them off as they go but that's not really how life works is it because you might doing the thing and then you might realize oh I've got to go and do something else and then you're like where am I this yeah so So you write the things you need to do and they all start with a box like this yeah an empty box and then say for example let's just use an example like I don't know email work right so I've got to email work I haven't done that yet so that box is empty Mm -hmm. then you might start writing the email Mm -hmm. to work so then once you've started it you put a line through it so you still get the dopamine hit from that half a line, you know. Yeah. So you put I've the line. Through. Something. <laughs> exactly. You put the line. You start writing the email. So you put the line through because I started that. Yeah. Then, I don't know. Bob calls. <laughs> Bob. <laughs> Bob calls, and he wants to talk to you about that money you owe him. Yeah. So you've got to take the call from Bob. So you've gone away from the email. So you are oh, Bob. Yeah. No, I've got the money. I'm good for it, mate. I'm good for it. <laughs> I don't know why I'm like this. So then Bob calls. And then you go back to the list and you realize, oh, I haven't finished that. But then you have to go and do something else. But you realize, oh, it's still half done. Yeah. Um, and then you go back to the email later. Let's say you need a response from the email. Yeah. Wow, I'm really, am I explaining yeah, this? Yeah. Back? So you're waiting for more info. Waiting for more info. That's this, that's this guy. Done mm. everything I can do here. So that is not started, started, done everything I can do. And then when you hear back from Jenny at work, who you were yeah. emailing, that's when you can put, you can cross it all out and you say it's complete you've just changed my life <laughs> did, did it make sense though it makes so much sense like yeah. I'm not joking so much and it's sense. really helpful so it's like and it's just amazing because you're gonna get that good feeling of like get that I'm, reward. Progr- I'm still progressing you know yeah and then that way like sometimes I mean you can probably see it on my yeah oh, chaos you can probably see it like you can see it here like these are tasks that have <gasps> all been like carried throughout mm. a week or so you know this was like I've got a Tala campaign get the images for something well I had to ask the question to my agent and then I'm waiting to hear back from her now so I can follow up on that I know that that is still waiting to be followed up on so sometimes these little um these things might last you know more than a week or two weeks but you just have it there and you know yeah. oh, well, that task is still like half done and I can go back to it so you're not forgetting things no it's and you don't like, feel like it's been on your list for so long and you're you know like sometimes I want something to come off my list but it can't yet yeah. because it's just not finished 
pro- exactly. like fully you're it's still it's on there but it's it's in progress then once it's, it's done you 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 exit out and you cross it off a list oh my god i'm starting this today this is amazing. It's really helpful sharifa <laughs> I Let love my well. list. <laughs> this is the thing as well, like it all started from awareness, and maybe as well because you've had your diagnosis a bit longer. This is what can yeah. happen for people, you know, having that awareness. Look at the stuff you can put in place to make your life work for you. We can do a workshop on this. Yes, <laughs> can we? we should. Please, we should. I think it's important because, like, this is the stuff. It's so simple, but this is the stuff. I just took me years to understand. Yeah, hacking your ADHD. Hacking, hacking your ADHD. That's what it can be called. How to hack your ADHD. Let's do it. Honestly, I'm, I'm game. so up for this. Let's I do am this. game. Um, you know, these little tiny things that might seem really insignificant to some people, they're not going to work for everyone, mm. but they work for some people. And once you've figured out how to hack your ADHD and work around it, it won't feel like a burden in the same way that it used to. It will just be like, okay, here's something that I have to manage. Mm. And you know, I know that on the days I don't manage it, then I might be a little bit more ADHD. You know, on the weekends, I don't take my medication. I don't like have a structure and I pretty much just flail around. But it's the weekend, so it's <laughs> Yeah, <fun>. exactly. <laughs> but during the week, you know, I wake up, I take my medication, I go out for an early morning walk. I exercise regularly. I get my lists ready. I get my timer ready. I get my thing ready. I drink my water. I don't have too much coffee. I don't get too drunk during the week. You know, like... yeah. So- things and then okay I'm having a good week because I've set myself up you know they say the saying is um what is the saying that I know it it's one of my favorites um one of my favorites prepare foul foul to fail prepare 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 to to fail fail. yes that's the one (laughs) that's the one that's it prepare to fail and that's I really believe that with ADHD like you can control the narrative like you can it's not doesn't have to be this thing that governs you and um you know spoils amazing opportunities in your life it can be something you can harness and you can work around you just have to understand your triggers and and sorry traits you have to understand your traits you have to get to know yourself you read research be introspective learn talk to people talk to other adhders like connect with the adhd community because you'll learn so much oh sorry that was going like you deserve a round of applause what that is amazing amazing positive words for the community thank you so much honestly this has been such a positive insightful chat the only other thing but I think I know the answer as well is you know in one oh no actually in one word what would you describe living with ADHD if you if you could choose one word that's so hard, hard to choose one <laughs> If you choose one word, what would living with ADHD be? Adventure. I love that. I'd say it's an adventure. adventure. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> love that word. That is a good one. <laughs> it definitely is a roller coaster. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you could go back, would you have ADHD or would you not? But I feel like you would, would you? I would never change who I am. No. I think ADHD is just part of who I am. Mm. I wouldn't change it. If I'd go back, honestly, if I could go back, I would have probably had a diagnosis younger. Yeah. Yeah, if I had a diagnosis uh, younger, I think I would have been able to, I think life would have been a bit easier. Yeah. And this is why a diagnosis is so important. You know, I feel so, when I hear people getting diagnosed, uh, you know, in their 50s, I'm like, you know, it's too late. We need to be, it's not too late, yeah. but it's, it shouldn't be that. Yeah. Long, I think you know? if you're struggling with it all that time, like it does break my heart to think, Me I know too. how hard I found life before my diagnosis. Yeah. And then like realizing that people are still going through that. And I, and I can see it when I talk to them, I can see like mm. how much it's affecting them just by how they're speaking about it. And I just think it's really really like hurts my heart me too yeah going through that without support because it's it's so misunderstood it is um underrepresented it is uh not taken seriously by anyone I don't think not anyone no. I don't think a lot of people take it seriously people are like oh ADHD what's that well I just forget things too um it diminishes what we experience mm. um 
or people are always diminishing what we experience and 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 I think sometimes making us feel like we're just kind of making up a problem mm. um, because they don't understand it and it really hurts my heart to think of people going through that by themselves without yeah. support and not knowing where to like how to get the resources because they're so hard to come by um honestly like social media has taught me so much stuff and that's but that's very sad that I'd need social media and not our NHS or our you know like medical establishments to put research into into ADHD and help uh, so many millions of people that are struggling with it help them with the research and you know I, I think it's really sad that that people aren't doing more but we'll get there <laughs> we will we definitely will thank you so much for listening to untangled i hope you find these podcasts as useful as i do i always leave feeling so inspired and like i've learned so much about my adhd I also want to use this opportunity to let you know about an amazing Discover Your ADHD Strengths Bundle I'm currently offering for free. This includes two Yoga for Strength classes, which are challenging and short, which is perfect for our ADHD brains, a meditation for releasing limiting beliefs and negative thoughts, and also a coaching workbook that will help you start to change your mindset around your ADHD and start to focus on your amazing strengths. You can find these either via my Instagram, which is ADHD underscore untangled or on my website, untangledco.com. I have a really exciting freebie to offer you guys as a thank you for joining me on this untangled journey. You will receive three of my favorite tools that I use to help manage my ADHD. You'll have two yoga for strength videos, which are really short and really challenging. So they're going to keep that ADHD brain of yours interested for long enough. And also a tapping meditation for releasing limiting beliefs. So this is a moving meditation. Again, I've really focused on making this as appealing as I can for those with ADHD. And lastly, I have created a coaching workbook that has little prompts to help you start rewiring that mindset to start looking and focusing on your amazing strengths that you have. You have so many and it's time to start really digging into those and really embracing them. So if you are interested in receiving this freebie, you can find more information either at my Instagram, which is ADHD underscore untangled or on my website, which is untangledco.com. Thanks again and stay strong, discover your strengths and I love you.